When you boot the Superboard 2 FPGA, one of the first things the basic program does is do a memory test and it comes up and tells you that we have 16K of RAM. There's a little less because some of it's used by basic itself. Let's take a look at what it would take to increase the RAM. If we want to get an idea of how much RAM we have, we can look in the design summary inside of Quartus. The design summary shows that we're only using 77% of the memory, which sounds like we should be able to add a lot, but it's not quite the case, and let's look at why. The data sheet for the Cyclone 4 uh, shows how much memory is available inside the part. The card has an EP4CE6 part. The EP4CE6 has 270 K bits of RAM. However, not all of that is available to us. The RAM is organized as 9 bits wide and that is 30,000 bytes in a 10 24 K byte block that results in 30 distinct RAM blocks of 1 K byte. If you do the math for our configuration, we should be able to put 3 more K bytes and that would have to go in as 1K byte and 2K bytes. To add additional RAM, go to the installed IP, library, basic functions, on chip memory, and RAM, and select the one port RAM. That'll launch the mega function wizard. At this point, select VHDL, and it you will need to create a name for that section of RAM. I've named the RAM Internal RAM 1K. Next, select the drop down for how many words of memory and select 1K or 1024 words. It's important if you want to run your design at speed to deselect the Q output port. Thanks to Crazy Ape for pointing that out in my previous video when I couldn't make the FPGA CPU run at 25 megahertz. That was the key that got me working. Select next to go to the next screen after this screen. Next again. This screen shows that the data address and write enable are all clocked into the part which should be fine but there's no clock on the output. That'll allow the RAM to run at quick speed. And next to go to the next screen. And that's it for the Mega Wizard. That this point, select Finish to create that. I'm only adding it to the current project. Now I store all of the cores and common elements in a common folder, so that will, by nature, fix it for all the places that it's used. So the part should be added to the top level entity and it shows up. In my case, back the path where I'm keeping all those common elements as the internal RAM 1K.VHD that we just created. So we need to do all the normal stuff inside of the microprocessor VHD file. In this case, we're inserting that internal 1K RAM. The CPU address is the same as the VHD file for that RAM, and it's from bits 9 down to bit 0. So 10 bits are used for 1K. Clock gets connected up to our clock on the card, that 50 megahertz clock. CPU date out is the common element that goes into all of the elements on the card. Um, and write enable is get get set to a chip select. Now this one I have set to RAM chip select three, but it would be RAM chip select two or whatever extra one it is. And then the Q gets hooked up. And again I've hooked up that 1K to the RAM data out three, but it could be RAM data out two or whatever particular elements being created. You should already have a RAM chip select, but below that I've created a RAM chip select two and a RAM chip select 3 because I put 2K and 1K additional into this part. Uh, add whatever you need to add but it should all match whatever your entity was. So here I'm showing the decode of the chip select for a 2K bank that I created. The 1K bank is right below it. The only difference between the size of the banks is the number of bits that the down two include and the number of bits that the comparison are to. If you don't get that exactly right, it's not going to work, and notice that the addresses go up. Uh, so basically you have to decode that part of the memory space that you want to have that RAM appear in and have it not conflict with one of the other spaces. Here's the memory map for the 6502 from Grant's page. 
the original page that Grant made um, ran on EP2, so it could only support 4K of internal RAM, but we've got 16K. The 16K that we have goes from address 0 to address 3FFF, and I've drawn it here on the right. Adding watermarks across for an extra 2K and 1K show uh, the addresses that should be decoded. Next, hook up the CPU data inlines to those chip selects. In this case, I hooked it up to two, but I think the example I had had three, so you do whatever you need to do appropriately. Uh, this covers both the 2K and the 1K RAM edition. This bit of logic forms a multiplexer to read the correct device. All the devices could present data, but only the one that's chip selected will present it into the CPU because it's multiplexed. We also need to add the data in, or data out, and data into the CPU, but data out of the RAM to the signal list. This shows, again, the 2K and 1K edition. Here's a look at the RAM summary after compiling, and you can find that by drilling down in through the summary results. This shows where the memory is used on the card. Uh, 8K for the basic ROM. 16 bytes are used for the UART as a buffer. Now that's a little bit of a pain because it's using a full 1K block because that's just the way the RAM works. You can only implement one thing in a block. There's 2K of true dual port RAM for the display. The OSI shares that display RAM between the output and what you can put into it. There's that 1K block that we've added, a 2K block and the original 16K block showing a, two, a total of 297 or 20, <laughs> 29,712 bytes and uh, the total count there of 237,696 bits. Again, those are nine bit blocks and you can only use eight of those bits. So. We've pretty much used up, or not pretty much, we've used up all the RAM here. There's nothing left once you've added those uh, 1K and 2K. And this is where the summary results can be a little bit deceiving because it only shows 86% of the memory bits on the part being used. But again, some of them are lost due to the size of that buffered UART, not quite taking up all the space. And some of them are lost by the 9 versus 8 bits. But um, that's not a bad utilization. That's, that's completely full. And here's the boot up screen showing 18,687 bytes free. And remember, we started with 15,000. So we ended up with uh, 3K more. No effort, really, just a few minutes of compiling and uh, debugging to get it to work. And a uh, nice little increase. Doesn't, doesn't have much effort and has a nice little result. But again, 3K out of 16K, well, it's it's worth doing. Not huge, but it's worth doing. If we want to go beyond the 18K, we'll have to figure out how to use the external SD RAM. And again, a shout out to Crazy Ape because he has created a SD RAM controller. I haven't tried it out yet. I wanted to take baby steps up till this point, but um, that'll be a future step hopefully, and we can get that working. We'll we should be able to get the full RAM space accessible, and that should be pretty cool. Anyhow, this uh, works pretty good. Thanks for watching. If you want more information, you can see our wiki pages for these products, and we have YouTube videos on them as well. We have a store in Tindy where we sell all of our cards. Thanks for watching our video, and if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.